Mr. Munnings, the printer, opens his shop door and waves to Miss Lovelace on the other side of the square. Morning, Miss Lovelace. Nice day. Yes, Mr. Munnings, and we are making the most of it. Come along, my darlings. Ah, thinks Mr. Munnings, it's all very well for Miss Lovelace to shut up shop and go for a walk, but I have some work to do. He turns and goes into his shop. The printing press is ready, and Mr. Munnings switches on the motor. I line up all the letters with spaces in between and clamp them in the printing press, a wonderful machine. Posters are in capitals, bold and fat and tall, but the printing in the daily news is often rather small. Now the inky roller comes down the type and back and makes the letters ready to be printed clear and black. I check the pile of paper for every single sheet will be printed by the inky type with letters clear and neat. When they have a flag day, I print the little flags, notices and labels, and even paper bags. I make the letters stand up straight and keep the paper clean. Then the job will be as good as anyone has seen. posters for the mayor's jumble sale. Now to phone the town hall. Hello? Hello? Oh dear, the line's dead. No dialing tone. I'll have to ask Mr. Platt to ring the engineers. And Mr. Munnings leaves his shop, crosses the market square, and calls on his old friend Mr. Platt, the clockmaker. Mr. Platt has cleaned the window cleaner's watch and is trying to make it go. Hello, Mr. Munnings. I'm having a terrible time with this watch. It's being very difficult. But I'll persuade it to do what I want. Clocks are rather like people, you see. Clocks are like people. Clocks are like you and me. Each has its own personality. Big clocks, small clocks, grandfather tall clocks, cuckoo clocks, hall clocks, mantelpiece and wall clocks, clocks for the schoolroom, the kitchen and the nursery, alarm clocks to waken us, urging punctuality. All of them chiming, or whirring, or clicking, cuckooing, or ringing, or tick-tock ticking. Clocks are like people, clocks are like you and me, each has its own personality. says Mr. Munnings. Would you very kindly ring the telephone engineers and tell them that my line is out of order? That's why I came to see you. Certainly, says Mr. Platt. Thank you very much. And Mr. Munnings goes out of the shop. The market square is buzzing with activity. Suddenly, a familiar sound is heard. Rag on a bone! Rag on a bone! It's Raggy Dan, the rag and bone man, with his barrow.
Raggy Dan's barrow is piled high with junk from people in the square. Rags, bottles and bones I cry, rags and bones I buy, I buy, listen for me as I'm passing by, rags, bottles and bones I cry, rags, bottles and bones. Bric-a-brac bicycles, books or brass, rags and bones I buy, I buy, pottery, pewter or china and glass. Rags, bottles and bones, I cry, rags, bottles and bones. Turn out the attic and under the stairs, rags and bones, I buy, I buy. Old-fashioned furniture, sofas or chairs, rags, bottles and bones, I cry, rags, bottles and bones. He's got a good load there, Mr. Munnings, calls Mrs. Cobbett, the flower seller. He's used to it. He can push that barrow for miles, says Mr. Munnings. Mmm, these are lovely flowers, Mrs. Cobbett. Yes, roses and violets today. My favourites, says Mrs. Cobbett. Roses, roses, by my red roses, scented so sweetly and fresh as the dew. Roses, roses, all you find gentlemen buy a sweet scented rose, but a buttonhole for you. Violets, violets, sweet-smelling violets, purple and tiny and fresh as the dew. Violets, violets, all you fine ladies, a bunch of sweet violets, a nosegay for you. Mr. Munnings buys a bunch of violets for his wife, then returns to his shop. He's just about to enter when Nick Fisher approaches. Hello, Mr. Munnings. Are the jumble sale posters ready yet, he asks. Why, yes, I was just going to phone the mayor about them. Don't bother about that, says Nick. He's asked me to get them put up as soon as possible. Pasting up the posters, sticking up the bills, putting up advertisements for sausages and pills, flower shows and concerts, you can take your pick, all neatly stuck by Bill Sticker Nick. certainly stuck that poster up well, says Mr. Munnings, straight as a die and no wrinkles. Yes, yes, marvellous job, says a voice behind him. Mr. Munnings turns and discovers that Walter Harkin, the painter and decorator, has been watching Nick too. Hello, Mr. Harkin. How's business? Not too bad, Mr. Munnings, but things would be much easier if people would take my advice about colours. They waste so much time changing their minds. People will ask me what colour to use There's pink and there's purple, it's so hard to choose Some ask for yellow and some ask for green 
And some ask for grey so the dirt won't be seen. Red is exciting and orange is bright And purple is rich as the sky at midnight Crimson is splendid for one kitchen wall And pink is quite pretty, perhaps in the hall Black paint and brown paint just simply won't do For an old-fashioned house where the For I think an old and new Painted white Ah, yes, very sound advice, Mr. Harkin, says Mr. Munnings. But here is someone with a nice straightforward job. And hurrying across the square, with his bag of tools and a coil of pipe under his arm, comes Mr. Wilkins, the plumber. Water heater takes too long to heat Overflow pipe dripping into the street A leaky old tap or broken waste trap Just send right away for the plumber Ball valve corroded or mud clogs the drain Winter has brought frozen pipes once again So turn off the tap that shuts off the main and send right away for the plumber. Water tank leaking and blocked with dead leaves that winter's cold winds have blown under the eaves. The water comes stealing down through the ceiling, so send right away for the plumber. Cause of the trouble is very soon found The old tank is lowered with care to the ground The new one erected and quickly connected And weatherproof water tight, tidy and trim Is soon with clear water filled up to the brim An excellent job by the plumber What's this? A post office van draws up outside the printer's shop. Mr. Wantage, the telephone engineer, and his assistant, Fred, get out and open a manhole in the pavement. Don't worry, Mr. Munnings, we'll soon have your phone working again, he calls. Ring, ring, I work for post office telephones. I'm the man you sent for if a fault appears I check the cable wire and cord connected to the telephones And then discuss the remedy with other engineers Hello? Hello? We're working on the line Ring, 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 ring Replace your receiver please Post office telephones will send an engineer your phone was disconnected by a fault we've now corrected We are sorry to have troubled you, but now your line is clear Hello, hello, your line has now been cleared Ring, 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 ring I test all the telephones Making certain all the lines are loud and clear Investigating each complaint of noises, loud or voices Faith the daily occupation of a P.O. engineer The occupation of an engineer There we are, Mr. Munnings, all fixed. Thank you very much. Mr. Munnings looks round the square. Everything is normal. There is nothing to prevent him getting on with his work. Hmm, pity really. Mr. Munnings doesn't feel like work this morning. He looks up at the flags fluttering lazily above the roof of the town hall. 
Hello, what's that? There's a black object on top of the third flagpole. Other people have noticed too and are staring up and pointing. The mayor comes out onto his balcony. He knows immediately what has happened. Mr. Clamp's cat is on top of the flagpole. Mr. Troop, he calls. It's Aggie again. Take the usual action, please. Hello, Trompton Fire Station. Captain Flack here. Oh, yes, Mr. Troop. Aggie, up the pole? Oh, not again. Not at all, Mr. Troop. All good practice. engine arrives at the town hall. Cuthbert, to the box. Elevate. Grab Aggie. Descend. Done, Captain Flack, says the mayor. A very fine rescue. Not at all, Your Worship. Aggie and ourselves are well rehearsed for this performance. I think it's the third time this month, isn't it, Mr. Clamp? Mr. Clamp, with his cat purring happily in his arms, shakes his head slowly. No, Captain Flack. The fourth, I'm afraid. I just cannot stop Aggie from climbing flagpoles. Well, we mustn't be too hard on her, says the mayor. After all, she gives us a chance of using our lovely fire engine. But for Aggie, we'd only see you on the bandstand, Captain Flack. Oh, my goodness, cries the captain. We must be off to get ready for the concert. Goodbye, Your Worship. Munnings looks up at the town hall clock. No, there's no point in starting work now. Just nice time to change into clean clothes, have a leisurely lunch, stroll over to the park and listen to the fire brigade band.
Here is the clock, the Trumpton clock, telling the time steadily, sensibly, never too quickly, never too slowly, telling the time for Trumpton. It is nine o'clock in the morning. The mayor of Trumpton steps out onto his balcony, takes a deep breath, and then looks round the market square below. taking down his shutters. Mr. Clamp, the greengrocer, is arranging some oranges. And here's Mrs. Cobbett, with her flower basket over her arm, hurrying to her pitch at the foot of the statue of Queen Victoria. The people of Trumpton are preparing for a busy day. turns and enters his office. Mr. Troop, the town clerk, is ready for him. Good morning, Your Worship. There are several papers for you to sign, I'm afraid. The mayor sits at his desk, picks up his pen, Brigade, library, road repairs, postage stamps, rubbish bins, swimming baths, broken window panes, park gates, waterworks, painting all the street lamps, dust cart, youth club, church bazaar, drains. There, says the mayor. That's that. And now I think I will inspect the park. Please call my car, Mr. Troop. I will leave as soon as I have purchased a red carnation from Mrs. Cobbett. The mayor hurries downstairs and through the front door. Mrs. Cobbett only just has time to pin his buttonhole into place before the mayoral car arrives. Thank you, Mrs. Cobbett. To the park, Philby, please. near the pond in Trompton Park. Philby helps the mayor out and hands him a bag of bread. I like the Robin's Mary song the thrushes and the lark But best of all I like the ducks who swim in Trumpton Park For ducks will never fly away as soon as I appear They swim up 
in their search for food without a sign of fear. Their heads are dark and shiny green, their feathers brown and white. Their yellow beaks are broad and flat, their eyes are round and bright. Merry song, the thrushes and the lark. But best of all, I like the ducks who swim in Trumpton Park. shakes the last crumbs from the paper bag, screws it up, and looks around for a rubbish basket. Here, your worship, I'll take that, calls the park keeper. Ah, Mr. Craddock, says the mayor. Everything all right? Everything's normal, says Mr. Craddock, and that means litter. Silver paper, toffee paper, dirty bit of cardboard, chair ticket, bus ticket, button from a dress, chocolate wrapper, envelope, another bit of cardboard. Can't they use the litter bins and not make such a mess? Leave litter in the litter bins and never leave a mess. And another thing, you worship, says Mr. Craddock. One of the park benches has collapsed. It's getting a bit old, I'm afraid. I've got Mr. Minton and his son Nibs working on it now. Over here, sir. Good morning, Mr. Minton. Good morning, Nibs. Ah, good morning, Your Worship, calls Chippy Minton. We're nearly finished and then this seat will be as good as new. I like my job as a carpenter, there's nothing I'd rather be. I've had my tools for many long years, they're all good friends to me. A mallet and drill are in my bag, a file and gimlet too. Sandpaper sheets, a brace and bit, a brad all and some glue. I like my job as a carpenter, there's nothing I'd rather be. I've had my tools for many long years, they're all good friends to me. I've chisels and saws, all keen and sharp, a jack and a smoothing plane. I know that oak will plane up true while mahogany changes grain. I like my job as a carpenter, there's nothing I'd rather be. I've had my tools for many long years, they're all good friends to me. Chippy, this wood's tougher than I thought. Warm work, eh, Nibs? Hello, what's that? It's Mr. Antonio, the ice cream man, cries the mayor. He couldn't have come at a better moment. Come along, ice is for everyone. I'll pay. ice cream van. If you want to buy a lolly, come as quickly as you can. If you'd rather have an ice, you will find they're very nice. Just hurry up and buy one from the ice cream man. Would you rather have a chalk ice or a corner or a brick? Or if you buy a lolly, please don't throw away the stick. 
Find the nearest litter bin, put the stick and paper in, and buy another lolly from the ice cream man. Under the trees, the mayor, Mr. Craddock, Chippy and Nibs are all eating ices. The mayor has taken off his robes and chain of office. It wouldn't do for him to be recognised eating ice cream in public. Madam, she says, everything here is quite exclusive, and I'm sure we have a hat that will be most suitable for you. A hat for a young girl so sweet and so slim Has long velvet ribbons and a wide shady brim With bright yellow daisies so fresh and so fair to echo the color of her long golden hair. A hat for a lady so fine and so grand must always be fashioned with a pure silken band and one single hat pin of a silver so rare to set as a contrast to her glossy black hair. You'll take this one, madam. I'll have it sent round. Good day. Mitzi, Daffy, Lulu. And from the back room come Miss Lovelace's three peaks. Come along, time for a walk. <coughs> Miss Lovelace locks up her shop and then, with Mitzi, Daphne and Lulu, she crosses the square. <coughs> Mr Clamp, the greengrocer, is very pleased to see her. Good morning, Miss Lovelace. What can I do for you today? As you can see, we've got absolutely everything. Vegetables, fruit ripe and beautiful, fine, fresh and fancy, come buy them from me. Come buy, come buy, come buy them from me. Cabbages, carrots and tender spring greens, broccoli, brussel tops, fresh runner beans, peaches and plums and pears by the pound, Parsnips and beetroot straight from the ground, apples and oranges, strawberries too, mushrooms gathered in this morning's dew, radishes, lettuces, onions, shallots, tomatoes, potatoes, and lots and lots of spinach. Come by my vegetables, fruit ripe and beautiful, 
fine, fresh and fancy, come buy them from me. Come buy, come buy, come buy them from me. Lovelace gives Mr. Clamp her order and he promises to deliver it. Come along, my darlings, to the park. In the park, Chippy and Nibs are about to resume their work when they see an old friend approaching them. It's Mr. Robinson, the window cleaner. Hello, says Chippy. What are you doing here? Going to clean the greenhouse? No, says Mr. Robinson, I've already done that. I'm working on the lamps now. Look at that one by the lily pool. Absolutely filthy. And Mr. Robinson sets his ladder against the lamp post, plunges his leather into a bucket of water, wrings it out and flicks it. It is hard to see out or for light to come in paint coated in a thin layer of grime. Mullioned or lattice work, frosted or plain, your windows will let in the sunshine again if you send for the man who cleans windows in time. Send for the window cleaner, don't delay, send he will come with his ladder, his leather and pail, and wash all the grime away. He will put up his ladder and fill up his pail, wring out his leather and give it a shake. The paint that he cleans, he will clean without fail, because of the paint he will take, because of the paint he will take. Send for the window cleaner, don't delay, send today. He will come with his ladder, his leather and pail and wash all the grime away. Well, you've certainly made that glass sparkle, says Chippy. But I must get on with my work. What with you and the ice cream man, I've been held up too long. Here, here's Miss Lovelace. Let's see, Daphne, Lulu, stop it. It's only Mr. Minton sawing wood. Three peaks are racing round and round poor Chippy, getting more and more excited. Mitzi suddenly dashes off on her own. She's not looking where she's going. She makes straight for Mr. Robinson's ladder. Look out! <laughs> Mitzi has upset the ladder and Mr. Robinson has fallen into the pool. Chippy and Nibs rush to help him out. Luckily, it's not very deep. Oh, I am so sorry, says Miss Lovelace. Mitzi, you naughty dog. Oh, Mr. Robinson, are you all right? But Mr. Robinson is frantically searching his wet pockets. My watch, he cries, my gold watch. It's in the pool. I'll never be able to find it in all that mud. The mayor knows exactly what to do. I'll call the fire brigade, he says. They can pump the lily pool dry, and then we can find the watch. The pool needs cleaning anyway. Hello, Trumpton Fire Station. Captain Flack here. The mayor here. A gold watch has been dropped in the lily pool in Trumpton Park. Can you come and pump it dry? What's that? A gold watch? In the Trumpton Park lily pool? Certainly, Your Worship. We'll be there right away. Right away.
fire engine arrives in the park and Captain Flack loses no time. Man the pump. The pool is soon emptied and Mr. Robinson's watch is quickly found. It is not long before the members of the fire brigade are on the bandstand with their gleaming musical instruments poised for the first item in the Trumpton Park Band Concert. Captain Flack takes up his baton and...